Today I'm, I'm going to be talking about the impact of disaster events um, and just looking a little bit more at about um, what we mean by them, where we get this information from, and what's included and not included um, in information that we take for granted a lot of the time. Um, so as David mentioned, uh, which I didn't know, you know, disaster reduction or disaster studies have been around since 1917, I think, or well, probably before then, I'm sure, in some other form. But um, we, just in the last 20 to 30 years, I think, um, this has really emerged as a field uh, with the emergence of climate change. Um, and, and now it seems like, you know, disaster <coughs> risk reduction or stories about disasters and climate change are everywhere. You come across them in the news. Um, almost uh, every day, and in academia, we definitely uh, pay a lot more attention to them. So, um, it, one one of the effects or or causes um, depends on how you look at it. Uh, of this this increase is that there is now a need um, and a demand for information about disasters, um, and specifically about the impact of disasters. What is the cost of these events? Um, how do they actually affect us? Um, where do they affect us? And, and I think generally, if, you know, we think we have pretty good information about disasters. We, we kind of know, you know, we, we have numerous uh, maps like this. We think we know where the risk is, um, you know, what part of the world is at risk. Um, we think we know pretty well what they cost us in terms of economic terms. Um, we can estimate things like that. And, and we think we know, you know, what the hazards are specifically, what affects us more, what we're more um, in, in danger of experiencing, uh, where the vulnerabilities lie. And, and we use this information for a whole variety of purposes, um, in general to inform ourselves, but also for very specific things like forming um, and creating policy uh, for impl implementing regulations. And also as the basis, um, and I think this is really important, um, as the basis of models for future risk. Um, for We use this information for probabilistic <coughs> risk assessments um, about uh, how we should act in the future uh, with respect to disaster risk reduction. So I'm actually looking at, in my work, a, a very specific aspect of disasters, which are small um, to medium-sized disasters, which I will come to later. But one of the, the first things I, I did was, um, we have all this in information, so how, how do we use it? What are, um, how can we actually practically uh, put it to use? And I, I just did a quick search, and I wanted to see what the losses or impact of disasters uh, was in, in the EU. Um, seems to be fairly straightforward. Um, the EU is a, a developed region. Um, we have great information and statistics <coughs> here. Um, and so the first thing I found was that um, this, this statistic um, officially on the European uh, Commission website, which says that in the last, well, in the, in the sort of decade or 12 years between 2002 to 2014, we um, in the European Union had 80,000 deaths and 100 billion um, euros worth of economic losses. So I said, great, that gives me an idea. Um, but then I looked further, and the next website, which was by the European Environment Agency, told me um, that between 1980 to 2011, which I agree is a different time frame, um, the European Union experienced 445 billion um, euros in losses. Now, I'm not an economist. I know there are some economists here. We're sitting in, in the Department of Economics. Um, but really, the first figure suggests, OK, well, Roughly over a decade, 100 billion. But in the second figure, then you have 445 over three decades. And to me, that's 150 billion euros is, is quite a lot of money. Um, it's not just some approximation. And it's a lot of money if you're someone in government um, or regional government who's trying to plan for the future. If you're someone in an insurance, um, in the insurance industry that's trying to estimate what your um, costs and, and models will look like in the future. Um, so if we actually, if you actually look at this issue of disaster loss accounting, um, we find that there's no internationally agreed definition 
um, or no set practice for how we calculate disaster losses. Um, none whatsoever. There's a complete lack of standards and guidelines for loss calculation. And this isn't just a problem in the developing world. This is actually um, true in, 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 in Europe, in America, every single country that you can name out there. What we do find is that there are um, fragmented efforts, usually at the national level. So you'll have perhaps the meteorological department um, keeping records of flooding. You might have someone in, in, in the Ministry of Agriculture that might keep records of losses in, in I don't know, the cotton industry or something very specific. Um, you might have uh, data on health, etc. Um, but the problem with all of these, and I'll be talking about this today in more detail, is that all of these records have different thresholds, they have different parameters, and they have different units of calculation. Um, so, so all this information that's being put out there, that's being put out there by the United Nations, by the World Bank, by the EU, by um, all these international organizations, and by your governments even, um, when they tell you that we need to focus on this aspect of risk or this hazard and not the other. Where is this coming from? Well, in the EU um, specifically, but also mostly around the world, most of this information comes from um, established databases. Now, there are three or four different kinds of databases. One, and, and the most reliable, that's used the most often, are um, in database, databases maintained by the insurance agencies. Um, because these are the people that really need to know how much money they're going to lose tomorrow if something happens. They're the ones that with the most incentive monetarily to keep these records. Um, and the big players in that are Munich Re and Swiss Re, which are actually reinsurance companies. They're the people that insure the insurance agencies. Um, and they have, they have these two databases. Um, uh, the second group is, of course, national databases, um, which I don't know um, how, how many European countries do you think have a national database? And the answer is zero. Um, I mean, and I think for me that was, sorry, but rather shocking. I come originally from Pakistan. I thought you guys would have your act together by now. Uh, but. Um, but yeah, so there's no, no comprehensive integrated uh, national database so far in, in the EU. And the, and the third kind of database are independent databases. These are usually maintained by research organizations or universities. And the one that's used the most um, and is the most famous and is the basis really of all the data that you see now being put out to you is MDAT. Um, sorry, my pointer, I guess, works. So that. And that, which is maintained by the University of Louvain in uh, Belgium. Um, but then there are also other ones that I'll be talking about. Um, and then at a, at a more local level, there's sort of, you know, the storm events databases in the US, so is Sheldis. Um, and I thought I'd mention disaster because um, that's actually a Portuguese database. So Portugal, um, it's, I think it's maintained by the University of Lisbon, um, the Department of um, or Institute of Geography and Territorial Planning, if I'm translating correctly. Um, but they've got a database called Disaster, and, but it only covers two hazards, floods and landslides, um, and it has rec a record of all the floods and landslides that have happened in Portugal since 1865, which is when I think when your um, newspapers officially started, or when press records started. Um, so when we... These are basically MDAT, um, I should bring it here, MDAT and um, Nathan or NatGAT by Munich Re are, are the, the two databases that are usually combined and that's where all the data on the European Union comes from um, and that's generally for international and global models as well, that's where all the information comes from. Now, when you read statistics like 100 billion in, in losses in, in, you know, between 2004 and 2012, part of, of the problem is that we as, as um, consumers of this information automatically assume that this is, this is true. And we assume um, things about this information, um, which then later results in problems. And you can 
we can discuss whether the responsibility is ours as, as consumers' information or the people that put forward this information. But um, so there's certain underlying assumptions. And one of the assumptions when we get this information is that every hazard is equally represented in, in these numbers. So when you read 100 billion worth of losses, you think, okay, they're talking about forest fires, they're talking about flooding, they're talking about everything um, that the European Union is affected by. But actually, in reality, um, specific databases were created for specific purposes, initially, anyway, even if now they're global or national or whatever their scope is. So for example, MDAT, which is mostly used um, was created for the humanitarian organizations. Um, and we'll be looking at how that affects its results a little later on. Um, the databases created for the insurance agencies focus a lot on monetary uh, losses. And so they don't necessarily look at hazards that, well, that they're not interested in because people won't insure their houses against, um, well, I don't know about Portugal, but forest fires, for example, or definitely not for drought or things like that, So, or extreme weather. Um, and then partly it's because, well, some, some hazards and some disasters are just easier to count. So it's really easy to look at losses after a flood event um, uh, because there's a lot of physical uh, impact from that hazard, whereas for drought, um, drought is, I think, um, in all the global databases, droughts account for only 10% of global losses. And we know that's not true, it can't be true. But because droughts are so hard, the losses from droughts are so hard to calculate. Um, a, they, they span a long time period, which makes it harder to estimate costs. There's not so much of a physical impact, most of their impact is um, on the agricultural sector. So people just leave them out, um, because it's a bit difficult um, to calculate. Um, and then there's the related sort of issues of multiple hazards and, and how you actually define an event because you might have a hurricane that leads to a storm surge. Now some databases will actually say a hurricane caused um, 20 deaths in, in Mexico and others will, won't will mention the hurricane and in their database will say no the storm surge actually caused you know, 20 houses to be destroyed. So you have the same event, sort of, or related events, but people will, will discuss it differently and measure it differently and um, describe it differently. Um, and that comes down to event definition. You know, what is, um, some people will just lump coastal hazards together while others will uh, differentiate between the two. So there's a definite, um, there is definite over and under representation of, of certain hazards. Um, there's a lot of double counting, um, and all of this leads to um, inaccuracies and inconsistencies in, in this data. Um, the second assumption that we make, um, and, I, and I showed this figure in the beginning, um, the, the chart, is that losses are comparable over time. So this is, this is a big thing because we're some of the messages being sent out are saying, well, disaster losses are increasing, and oh, this is climate change. Um, you can look at this graph and see our losses are increasing, and that's because there's, uh, it's a changing climate. That's not necessarily true or accurate. Um, and, and that's because, well, first of all, we're just better at reporting losses now, and we have better instrumentation, and we're better at keeping records. Um, it's also because of population and wealth growth. Um, so we're experiencing more, experiencing more losses because there is more people and there is more things to lose. Oops. Uh, um, and also when you look at a graph like this, this is actually inflation adjusted. Um, so it's, well, it's the only database out there. It's uh, from the Munich Re, um NatGat service. Um, and they do, infl uh, they do adjust for inflation, the others don't. Um, but even then, there's a lot of things that you don't see in here. So, for example, um, it seems from this that there were almost, well, there were very um, few losses in the year 2000. But you might find if you go back that that's because for some reason um, they weren't able to capture data for the year 2000 or um, some information was missing. And a lot of times, and this has happened in the US, um, they changed the reporting units. So for Sheldis, for example, before they only had to report losses um, in rough categories of between five to $10,000. Um, 
10 to fifteen thousand dollars and then from 1985 onwards they had to give exact figures so if you look at the data in shell this it seems like there's a trend but it's actually because the way they reported that data changed completely um, another um, aspect that we don't necessarily think about um, is that we assume that all losses, irrespective of event size, are counted. This is sort of the, the focus of my research, which is why I started looking at these things in the first place, because I look at small disasters. Um, so if you, if you look at, and it, it takes us back a little bit to a sort of slightly boring epistemological questions and also th thinking about, well, what is a disaster? Um, and I know we've discussed that to death, but um, if you look at MDAT, which was created for the humanitarian organizations initially, the definition of what a disaster is, which comes from ISDR and, um, and everything, is 10 dead, uh, 10 or more people dead, 100 or more affected, uh, whether there's a call for humanitarian help um, or a declaration of national emergency. Um, now, there's a lot of events that happen that I would think are disasters that are not included in this. And it's really interesting to note because and that because it was created for the humanitarian organizations, doesn't talk about money or losses. Whereas if this was a database for the insurance agency, that's probably what they would be focusing more on and they probably wouldn't be concerned about whether there was a call for humanitarian help or not. What happens in these databases is that they don't cover smaller events, what we call smaller events, but actually might have great uh, monetary impact. They also I exclude a lot of um, hazards that have um, that have a monetary impact or, or other kinds of impacts. So, for example, drought or um, even forest fires. I don't know very much about forest fires, but I imagine there are some that were, you know, there aren't 100 people affected or 10 dead, but I imagine the the damage costs in terms of monetary terms are great. Uh, monetary terms are great. Well, those wouldn't be included in MDAT. You won't find the data there. It's like that disaster never happened when you look at statistics. Um, a problem with the databases in general is that all of them, what we have so far, except for the random organizational ones, subnational ones, they're all at the national level. So if you were to go out and look for um, data on Portugal, you will only be able to get data at the national level. There's no way you could um, zoom down to the provincial, regional, or local level. Um, and I'm talking about overall data on hazards. Another problem also is that the, a lot of this data is not publicly available, by the way, so you have to pay for it. The insurance agencies give out some of their data for free, but the rest of their, uh, their um, data and models are actually private. So people just don't have access to this information. Um, anyway, so coming back to threshold bias, um, there's the discrepancies in what's included, what's not, and there's a tendency, and I find this um, in academia as well, if you do a, a search for disasters, um, literature on di published on disasters in the last 10, 20, 30 years, you'll notice that the events that are covered are the big ones, the, the tsunamis, the you know, the big earthquakes, etc. And no one's really talking about the smaller events that happen on a more regular uh, basis and probably cause more damage. I won't go on in that because that's what I do and I love that, but um, I think it's, it's definitely a lack. And then really quickly, we assume all types of losses, uh, oops, we assume all types of losses are included in this information, and um, which is not true at all. So a lot of the times monetary losses are. Um, of course, this is calculated by insurance agencies and they look at the cost of reconstruction. So when, in order to calculate losses, they, they, they calculate how much it would cost to replace things that are lost. Um, um, but there's not necessarily that much on um, sort of the human um, cost of all. Human losses are uh, actually deaths. We have a lot of direct losses, but nothing on indirect losses. So as David said in his talk earlier, um, in La Aquila in the first year, 16,000 jobs were lost. Um, there's no way that that number or that impact is in any way represented in the numbers that you read. Um, again, in short, um, people that are insured, their losses are calculated, uh, but uninsured, um, sometimes insurance agencies assess uninsured losses as well, but that's more because their models are trying to calculate potential markets in the future. Um, in the developing world, there's a whole layer of people that will never get insurance that insurance agencies are not necessarily interested in, and their losses during disasters are not necessarily captured by the data either. 
um, and social and environmental. Um, environmental is really important because uh, losses to ecological um, systems, um, you know, if there's a, a dam that bursts because of an earthquake, um, how is that loss going to be represented in your figures? Well, a lot of the times you'll find maybe it's not even included. And then um, the last assumption that I'm going to be talking about, and there are a lot more, is, is that hazard losses are comparable across geographical units, and this is because over time boundaries have changed. So if you're looking, for example, for um, losses in, in Croatia, you know, before 1991 there was no Croatia, Croatia so you'd have to take information from Yugoslavia, etc. And also scale changes. Um, so people change regional boundaries. Also, if there's, there's also a problem of double counting geographically because if there is an earthquake um, and or if there's a, there's a hurricane and it affects you know two different locations, where do you say the losses were and how do you kind of represent that numerically, um, etc. So overall, we find that basically there are a lot of um, systemic biases um, in the data and because of the way these databases are set up. Um, and if you actually think about it, um, there's a lot of things that get left out um, at, the, at the end of the day um, that are not included in this data. And I know one can say, well, you know what, this is the best we have. This is the best we can do right now. And it's an estimation. Everyone knows it's an estimation, so let's just go with it. But you know, there's a really famous saying in, in economics, um, a bit deterministic, I think, but um, it, which says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I do think that to some degree, in terms of at least disaster management, um, that does apply and, and is true. And it causes a lot of problems, I think, um, at the institutional level because you have no way of knowing nationally what your losses are, where they're happening within your country, um, what, which communities are affected, how the environment is going to be affected. It, it also creates problems because we have no baseline data. Um, so we create all these policies and mitigation measures um, and we say, oh, we think it worked or it didn't work, but how do you actually know if it made a difference if you don't even know what it is that you're changing um, in the first place? And um, again, um, people that work at the local level, I'm sure, experience this, this lack of information a lot more acutely. So people working in civil defense, etc. So maybe your organization has records, maybe they don't, but it's very hard to disaggregate this information down to the local level. Um, it's almost impossible, and then kind of coming back to the Sendai framework. I know this is this is part of what, um, what are they called in the Sendai framework? Um, the actions, or um, it's part of the second action, I think, which is improving information for better governance. Um, because I think without a solid uh, information base, uh, you're going to have a very hard time justifying your policies, especially for the future. Um, so I just want to stress this point where we all accept that there's bias that exists in any sort of form of data collected um, at this level, but then when does this bias change into flaw, and then when does that flaw change into fallacy? When do we actually start, get to a stage when we're talking about things that are not accurate or true at all? Um, and I think when we're using data on disaster impacts and losses, that's something we need to at least highlight when we're mentioning this information, rather than just kind of putting it there, um, putting it out there as fact. Um, and yeah, and, and in terms of building back better um, and that whole dialogue, um, I think we need to remember things like this. Um, but I want to end on a negative note. Um, there is hope, and I think for me, um, I'm just going to mention in the end, um, that this Inventar database, um, which I listed at the beginning. So this inventor was a database that was developed in 1992 um, by a group of Latin American academics. So a bunch of people in South America got together and said, hey look, A, we don't have a system for calculating losses, we don't know what's happening, and B, the systems that are sort of there are not good enough. Um, and they developed this database that captures, is unlike MDAT, it actually captures smaller events as well. So they actually have people that read 
um, the newspaper every single day and they scan items and they have their own criteria and thresholds but these criteria and thresholds are a lot more flexible and lower um, than the ones that exist in the insurance databases or in, um, in MDAT, etc. And the thing that I find is really, that's really interesting is that they've developed this database, it's for free, you can download the software, any country can use it, and there are actually 85 countries around the world that now have a national disinventar database. Um, the surprising thing is that all of these 85 countries are in the developing world. So they're in Latin America, they're in Asia, they're now in Africa, um, but none in Europe. I've put down three European. That's a bit of an exaggeration because Turkey, Serbia, and Spain have it, but when I say Turkey, Serbia, and Spain, I mean there's one mayor in a town in Malaga or somewhere that heard about this and went there, thought it was cool, hired someone, and they've now got a local database about their records in, in Malaga or somewhere. Um, so same with Turkey, same with Serbia, although Serbia, I think, is, is a lot bigger. Um, I'm really sorry if you can't see the numbers because I hope you can, because this is what I want to show. Extensive, um, it says risk type, which is extensive or intensive. And Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, it says they're extensive or intensive. And by ex intensive, really, this is, this is the big disasters, the extreme events. And in extensive risk is the sort of smaller scale, more chronic disasters. And um, if you look here, you, the total number of events, um, for extreme events are 3,015, which kind of corresponds to the information MDAT has. But if you include the smaller events, which this inventor does, you actually end up with 300,000, um, I'm really bad with numbers, um, no, 346,000 um, events. Um, so that there's a lot more, and even in terms of, well, deaths is off, I'm not sure why. Um, so there's, there's a big change between the two the sets of data depending on how you look at it. Um, and there was actually, um, the UNISDR picked up on this inventor, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the GAR, the Global Assessment Report. Um, they've produced three of those so far. And the data that they've used for the Global Assessment Report um, they've actually pulled out from this inventar. So they've used this information rather than the MDAT data, which the EU insists on still using MDAT data. And I just want to show you the difference, and I think this is Indonesia, um, between, so this is what MDAT reported, and this is what was reported when um, they used data from um, from this inventor. And again, this inventor gives you a lot more information. A, it gives you information at the local and regional level, but it also gives you better information about where the hazards are actually affecting people, how many people are affected, etc. And, and I just want to leave you with this, which is, if economic losses from small disasters were projected into existing calculations, real direct economic losses would be 60% higher than currently reported in MDAT. Um, and, I, and this is just when it includes small disasters. If you think about all the other ways in which we're leaving out information about different hazards, um, about um, how we calculate uh, information, then really the amount of, the impact of disasters we find is a lot higher um, than we, what we think it is. So that's it for me for now.